Hello. Welcome to the Icon Virtual Health Program. How are you? My name is Barbara Ho. I'm a registered nurse. I'm a chief nursing officer of Icon Chinese Division. I'm the MC of today's event. Welcome people who join us online. Welcome to this health online forum. Healthy living, healthy heart, digital emergency medicines, which have established over 16 years, led by Dr. Ho. The purpose is to help BC multicultural groups, patients, their families, by reliable health information, community resources, and network in respect of chronic disease education, prevention, and self-management. By way of forums, health forums, workshops, and web technology to help patients with sick disease awareness, teach them best health practices to reduce disease risk, and advocate for formal therapies, and also help them access reliable health network and electronic tools, become more familiar with technology, digital technology, and how to use them for better health quality. Today, we are so happy to a representative from the province, provincial government, Ministry of Health, to give us an opening remark. Thank you for the opportunity to provide opening remarks at today's Healthy Living, Healthy Heart Forum. I'm Lindsay R. Scott, the Director of Primary Care Quality within the Primary Care Division of the Ministry of Health. I would like to acknowledge and offer my respect and my gratitude to the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory I am located on in Saanich, and to the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. I would also like to acknowledge the Métis Chartered Community located in Victoria. Patients as partners believe that engaging patients and their families, healthcare providers, and community partners in healthcare is not only the right thing to do, but is an effective way to make the health system better and the people of BC healthier. This philosophy is summarized by the motto, nothing about me without me. Patients as Partners has collaborated and funded ICON for over 10 years with Dr. Kendall Ho as the executive director for all of that time. ICON continues to bring healthcare providers together to speak with people in their first languages about topics they have asked to learn more about. And today, that is about heart disease. Cardiac Services BC states that heart disease is one of the leading causes of death in Canada. However, they also state that about 90% of premature heart disease can be prevented with good health practices. Today's presenters will discuss what heart disease is, how to prevent heart disease, and most importantly, how to live well with heart disease. Resources will be provided that can empower you and your family to optimize your health. The encouragement and support from working together as a family and in the community can make it easier to make these health changes. I wanna thank ICON for bringing us together today and I invite you to check out the resources after this discussion. You will find information on heart disease and other health topics as well as websites where you can enroll in self-management, health coaching and other peer support programs. These programs provide information, skills and support to help you achieve your health goals. I wanna express a big thank you to ICON and our presenters today and tomorrow. I appreciate your time and wanna thank everyone for attending. What you do for your health can make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. So the title for today's forum is Healthy Living, Healthy Heart. 
heart disease is a terrible name because the incident rate is higher and mortality is high. It can kill people without any sign or indication due to the diet and living habit of the modern people. More young people are getting sick of heart disease and it's become very popular. So we would like to share with everyone today and tomorrow on topic in respect for heart disease. Today, we would like to learn about the heart disease and how to know about the atrial fibrillations and also discuss what are the digital tools and resources we can help you to better manage heart disease. And tomorrow, we will learn about the difference between men and women with heart disease and also stress how to lower your stress to minimize the heart disease and also learn practical cell care tips and lifestyle management to help you stay active. So I would like to introduce three speakers for today. First one is Dr. Peter Ling. He's an internal medicine specialist, graduated from the Faculty of Internal Medicine uh, of UBC. And he's now working in the Ripson and Burnaby hospitals as internal medicine specialist and also take part in public education. The second one is Dr. Kendall Ho. is an emergency physician and the lead of UBC Digital Emergency Medicine Unit. And he is also the executive director of INICOM. His interest and specialty is digital um, medicines and how to use the technology to help improve patients' health condition. The third one is Dr. Chen Xiu Him, cardiologist, complete his uh, PhD of medicine in UBC and completed internal medicines and cardiologist training. He worked in Burnaby Hospital and Richmond Hospital. Okay, without any further delay, we would like to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Peter Ling, internal medicine, to explain what is metastatic heart disease and what is the risk factors and how to prevent complications. Mr. Ling, Dr. Ling, thank you for coming to this forum. I leave the floor to you. Thank you, Icon, and thank you uh, to UBC uh, Emergency Digital Medicine. Thanks for your support uh, for me to talk about this topic. So today I'm going to talk about uh, an overview of heart disease uh, risks and how to prevent it. So and also prevent complications. Like uh, Barbara said, this is an invisible killer. So, but if we um, do the right thing, we can uh, prevent it. So, uh, today I'm going to talk about what heart disease is and uh, what symptoms uh, there are for heart disease and uh, what kind of signs you can expect. So, let's see what about uh, the, the common um, illnesses that lead to heart disease, the risk factors, and also the prevention uh, and how to prevent it from getting more serious. So uh, coronary artery disease, what disease, what is it? It is uh, when our, our arteries are clogged. Uh, you know that the arteries uh, supply blood to the uh, organs uh, so, so they, they can function so that we can survive. So the uh, our arteries for the heart is called coronary artery. So if it, they are clogged and the heart may not have enough blood, so there may be anemia and there may be other uh, complications. So if, if the f f fatty tissues and all of that uh, clog the coronary artery, the blood cannot be supplied to the heart, so you will have heart disease, uh, risk of having um, coronary artery disease. And so I'm talking about the risks now, uh, for example, uh, symptoms. What kind of symptoms? So the most common ones 
uh, my the patients will feel the uh, chest discomfort. I'm not talking about pain, but it feels like something is pressing it. Something uh, is like a heartburn feeling. Someone will tell me that the their jaws feel pressured, or maybe the arms or the back um, feel tingling. So it's not pain, it's just discomfort. So some patients may tell me that they have shortness of breath. Uh, for example, if they walk, they feel uh, they have to gasp. And if they do exercises, well, only after a short while they will start getting tired or they have shortness of breath. So you have to be careful because uh, your heart may have some problems. Of course, there are many illnesses that can cause this, but if you're careful, so I suggest uh, that you uh, seek doctor, doctor's help soon. So. There are m many ways we can diagnose uh, coronary ar artery disease. The most common way to diagnose it is to do a ECG, uh, ECG which is an electrocardiogram. The doctors will, uh, or technicians will put something around your heart, something electrodes, uh, so uh, to tell you that there is a problem with your heart. But sometimes. People will tell me, I don't have problem uh, sitting. I, only when I jog or run, then I feel um, pressure in the heart. So they may give you a stress test. What, what a stress stress test is, you just uh, get on the treadmill. But the t time that you are on the treadmill, they do uh, ECG. So when you're running, when you're jogging, they will know whether their your CG chain uh, ceased. ECG would change, or if you feel a uh, discomfort, and then if there are changes in the ECG, it, which may tell you that uh, you may have heart disease. Another way to diagnose it is uh, to do a echocardiogram. In English, that is called echocardiogram. So to see if your heart, the functions, or the uh, contraction uh, are normal. So if there is something abnormal, we can see it. So it's something that's easy to do. So you, the patient only have to lie down, and the technician will put some gel or some liquid to the, on the chest, and they will see the heart and they'll see how, uh, how the heart functions. And uh, another thing is uh, after you've done all these, and if there is a chance that you have coronary artery disease, the doctor may arrange you to uh, refer you to a specialist and do a uh, cardiac uh, catheterization, Ca catheterization, and so to see if, um, if the, the coronary arteries are clogged. If they are clogged, the doctor may want to treat you, uh, uh, put you on a stent. So, because some uh, somewhere it's uh, it's um, clogged, so you have to put a stent in it to uh, uh, diagnose heart disease. So how would I know whether I have heart disease or not, whether I will have heart attack or not? Uh, I'm asked often that question. So what is a heart attack? So uh, like I said, if all of a sudden you feel discomfort in the heart, or uh, that on top of sweating or shortness of breath or fatigue, anyway, if you feel all of a sudden all these things, so a lot of the times I tell the patients uh, to consult a doctor as soon as possible. If possible, they have to call 911 to call an ambulance to take them to the hospital because uh, when a, a heart attack happens, it can be very, very serious. So so uh, you have to know what the symptoms are. And sometimes my patients are telling me, oh, maybe not, uh, maybe it's not a heart attack, maybe it's something else. Well, if you're not sure, then, well, don't worry. Just go to the doctor first. Even if it's not a heart attack, no one will um, criticize you. So as, at least you know what the risks are, what the symptoms are. Another thing that I uh, just uh, forgot, mention, forgot to mention is somebody says that the chest is, uh, has discomfort, maybe nausea, maybe that's also heart attack because, um, because uh, there are not uh, very obvious symptoms or signs f for heart disease, so you have to be, uh, don't, uh, don't overlook anything. So what is heart failure? Actually, the heart itself is a pump, so the function is to uh, pump your blood into our, uh, different organs, for example, even your muscles, your brain, and uh, your intestines and other organs, so, so it's a pump. And so if you, are, uh, you have heart failure, so if uh, there is a heart failure, um, 
tendency. So that means the pump is not working well. That means uh, the blood is not uh, um, going forward, so it's going backward. What happens when the blood goes backwards? So you know that the heart and the lungs work together. So if it goes back, if it ebbs, so sometimes the blood will go into uh, your lungs. For example, there's um, um, if the pump does, uh, the, the blood does not pump well, then you will have a swelling in the legs. There are many reasons for having swelling in the legs. It's not just heart failure. I'm not trying to scare you. So it's not just a heart disease. Uh, heart failure, one of the symptoms is uh, swelling in the feet. Uh, so you may want to consult your doctor. So. What are the causes of heart failure? I said that there are many causes. The most common causes are uh, what for like a coronary ischemic heart disease. So uh, coronary uh, artery is to pump blood into the heart. If the, 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 the vessels are clogged and the, the pump starts to uh, dysfunction, so, so you, it will lead to heart failure. So. Uh, yeah, so the most common cause is the coronary ischemic heart disease. Another thing is we call idiopathic, uh, idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, so the doctor will also uh, help you to find out if you have that as well. C hypertension is another common thing. Uh, so just think that this is a pump and then there's only that much power if you have high, high, hypertension. So the, if there's too much pressure on the uh, artery, so there is not enough uh, power to resist that. So uh, hypertension is uh, one of the causes. The last thing is we call the uh, valvular disease. Uh, it's at the, the, about the valves in the heart. So if it ha has any problems, it will cause uh, heart uh, valvular disease or uh, heart failure. If it has a problem, maybe the blood will ebb and it will flow back. So uh, this is also a common cause, and the doctors can find out uh, with uh, um, ultrasound. So what are the risk factors of heart disease? At, uh, uh, actually, uh, heart disease, uh, there are three kinds of uh, uh, heart uh, risk factors. We call it three highs in Chinese. So uh, like, for example, diabetes, hypertension, and uh, dyslip dyslipidemia. So uh, sometimes the doctors uh, will ask you, well, uh, ask, hear from the patients, how come you're so concerned about this? I, I don't have a pro any problems with any of the three highs. So, but I have a good ha appetite. I don't have uh, heart, uh, chest pain. Well, actually, if you have three highs uh, chronically, it will gradually increase your risk of having heart disease. So you have to be careful. You have to uh, try to avoid having any of these three highs. And uh, now we come to uh, diabetes. So let's talk about diabetes first. Now, what is diabetes? Well, uh, diabetes is when our body cannot normally use the glucose. So after we have uh, some sugar intake, the cells would uh, absorb the uh, sugar. But when you have uh, uh, there is a hormone inside our body called insulin. So that's, uh, created, that's uh, produced by the pancreas. So the in function of the insulin is to bring your the, the sugar into your cells, to feed your cells so that they can put produce energy and make you make you work now if the body does not have enough insulin it, what happens is that there is called a type 2 diabetes um, so you have to have insulin injection because your body can absorb the insulin or produce enough in, insulin so and the uh, sugar uh, accumulates in the uh, blood and that's the most common type um, um, many patients ask me, what happens when my blood sugar level is high? But I don't feel anything. I don't feel anything wrong. But the problem is here. When you have high blood sugar, and the, it's not good for your blood vessels. Say, for normal blood vessels, it's clean. It's very neat, tidy. Okay, But if you have diabetes, for example, if you have uh, uh, high cholesterol, when you uh, have blood sugar level, then you have uh, what we call the... Um, 
sclerosis of the blood vessels because the sugar can damage the uh, walls of the blood vessels. So. Uh, everywhere in the body, there's uh, blood vessels because uh, it's like the, the brain, the kidneys, the, and the, also the legs. If the blood sugar level is high, it damages your, for example, if it damages the blood vessels in the brain, you may have a stroke, or if it damages the blood vessels in the heart, then you have heart disease, or if it damages your kidneys, then you have renal disease. If it damages your legs, then you may have a, a and then you have a blood vessel uh, disease. So, so uh, diabetes can uh, affect a lot of uh, different parts of your body. So it's not just uh, blood sugar. It's not as simple as that. It can um, affect your brain as well as other organs. And some patients would ask me, what are the symptoms of diabetes? Actually, I can tell you that most of the uh, Patients of diabetes don't have any symptoms. Maybe their blood sugar level is a little higher, or maybe they feel f thirsty, or maybe they have frequent urination because if the uh, blood sugar level is uh, uh, high, then you, uh, the urine will will uh, bring out uh, the ex excess sugar. Some patients, if they are serious, their weight they they may suffer weight loss because uh, because there's enough insulin, because there's already a lot of uh, sugary substances, but the, the cells cannot absorb them, so gradually, uh, uh, so you have gain, gained loss. Also, blurred, blurred vision, because it also affects the eyes. So, uh, rarely uh, do you have symptoms. Most of them do not have symptoms. So how do you know whether you have diabetes or not? I tell my patients that if you already have high blood pressure, if you have high cholesterol, so I try to talk to the doctor, I try to see if the, you're diabetic or not, or if it's hereditary, or if your family, your parents, your siblings have uh, diabetics, so you have to watch out your um, diet, don't uh, have too much sugary intake, and so it will uh, n not increase your risk of having diabetes. So how do we know whether you have diabetes or not? Because the doctors can check it. There are three ways to check it. There's one is called A1C hemoglobin A1C test to see what is the average value. There is also called something called fasting blood sugar. There's also another thing called oral glucose. Uh, but because of time constraints, uh, I'm going to just uh, briefly touch on the diagnosis. So what's the fasting blood sugar? Fasting blood sugar is when you have fasted for eight hours, like you don't eat breakfast when you wake up in the morning. So when you have an empty stomach, if it's still high, then the doctor will also test you one more time. If it's still over seven, there's a great chance that you may be diabetic. Another thing is called A1C, to see if the uh, hemoglobin itself, how much sh how much uh, glucose is there. So you do that every once every three months. Um, some uh, The normal is of 5.7 or lower, but if the ASL is six, over 6.5, there's a chance that he's diabetic. The last test is if somebody wants to be more accurate, so the doctor will arrange for a, to go to a lab and, and uh, drink some very sweet uh, syrupy substance, and after two hours you have a blood test. If the number is over 11, it means the absorption is not good enough to um, digest the sugar. So, so that's diabetic, di diabetes. Um, if it's your blood sugar level is over 11, then chances are you may be uh, diabetic. So there are three uh, ways to diagnose um, diabetes. So how do we know uh, what ways can we control diabetes? Uh, I usually tell people to check your blood sugar level at home. No, don't just rely uh, to have it done in the lab. That's not enough because you have to do it frequently at home. And um, what do you do? Uh, what else do you do? Well, diet is also very important. Usually, I want my patients to change their lifestyle, uh, do more exercises, watch the diet. If that doesn't work, well, then take medications. And also, uh, how do you do? Uh, how do you test your blood level at home? So, I don't n n know whether you have di uh, pre-diabetes or not. Whether you have uh, serious uh, di di uh, diabetes or not, you have to test your blood sugar at home. So, 
the best is to keep your uh, fasting blood sugar uh, glucose between four to seven, um, and then two hours after a meal, the optimum is between six to ten. Well, some people ask me how how would I know these numbers? Well, you have to check them. Otherwise, you won't know. Some patients will ask me, well, how many times will I check? How frequently should I check? But traditionally, uh, because you put your finger, that's a very traditional way. Uh, you have to poke it many times a uh, day because you have to poke it on. On an empty stomach, and after you have a meal, so in the morning, and then after every meal, after have breakfast, after lunch, after lunch, so that's four times a day. A lot of people cannot do that because poking a finger is painful, right? And it's not convenient. If you have a meal outside, uh, it's not, it's, it doesn't look good. So, and so uh, for the past six years, there are new ways to test your blood sugar. So, the one is called flash glucose monitor, it's a gadget that you put on your arm. There are two, uh, two such uh, gadgets in BC. One is to put on your arm. One is to put on your uh, stomach. The idea uh, is to, after you put it there, they will keep sending messages to your cell phone. Uh, for example, this uh, lady here. So she said, "Oh, she knows that it's six point two uh, uh, every uh, five minutes, uh, depending on the brand that you use." The thing is, you have to have to uh, put your finger and and uh, another way and that's uh, better than poking finger. But it only takes one second to find out because after you uh, poke your finger, finger, then you may have to wait a long time. So this way, after one second, you will easily find out what how high your blood sugar level is. For example, after you take a meal after you have a dessert, or whether you have the bun, uh, or uh, it's over 10 after one hour, so you want to bring it down to uh, under six. So next time, don't eat such uh, sweet stuff as uh, a pineapple bun or whatever. Uh, so uh, for example, if you put that in the bathtub, that's fine. If you soak it in the water, you can change, replace to anyone after 10 or 14 days. So I tell my patients to use it a lot. Another way uh, to, uh, uh, another advice I give you is to watch your diet. It depends on what you put in your mouth, and that also can affect your chances of having diabetes. So it, on a plate, uh, optimally, 50% uh, should be vegetables, 20% should be protein, and the other 25% should be carbs. So if it's carbs, uh, try, or if you have starch, try to eat whole, whole grain products. Uh, first, you eat your vegetables, 50% of the vegetables, then your proteins, and last, uh, carbs, uh, starches, because if you uh, well, well it's, it's, of course, not so much uh, salad dressing, uh, because after you've eaten the vegetables, the, the fibers will prevent you from uh, having your blood sugar level uh, rise so much. But if you start with starches and still, uh, and then the vegetables later, then your blood sugar level will tend to rise more rapidly and higher. So. Another thing is that the fibers can fill up your stomach so you don't feel that uh, empty. So, uh, so having vegetable first and then protein and carbs, it will fill your stomach better. Now here we have uh, a, a pamphlet uh, that uh, tells you what are unrefined uh, whole grains and what are refined whole grains. Uh, this is. Uh, this uh, graphic is quite complicated. I just want you to remember one thing. Don't eat white stuff. Don't eat white ri rice, white bread, because their, their index are high. So try to select something that's brown, for some brown rice or wheat bread. Uh, so we know why brown is better, because uh, because they are fibers. The fibers, uh, they, 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 will, they will wrap up the starch in the middle. So when you eat brown stuff, and then your blood sugar level would not have rise so fast. And uh, if you eat white bread and white uh, uh, rice, and then and, uh, because it's already refined, you don't have something uh, buffer, uh, some uh, fiber to absorb. So if you eat white bread or white rice, rice uh, uh, you will your blood sugar level will rise higher. Uh, so. And another thing is uh, taking doing exercises, but be careful. Uh, here in Canada, um, 
for for heart disease index, uh, they suggest that for adults, uh, every uh, day, not every day, of course, every week, you do 150 minutes of exercises. Uh, what, what exercises do you do until you sweat? Uh, you do it until your heart beats fast. So some older people ask me, I cannot run, doctor. Uh, I, I'm not used to running. Well, you don't have to be so strenuous. As long as you start uh, perspiring, uh, when you when you're talking, it becomes not difficult. Uh, that uh, a little difficult. That's good. But you don't have to do 150 minutes in one go because some uh, patients they they don't have 150 minutes in a day. So actually, it's not as good if you do it in one go. Uh, it's better to do it like 30 minutes at a time. I have five times a week, so that makes that makes 150 minutes. So it's good for your uh, heart and uh, lung functions. Um, for di medications for diabetes, there are two types. There's oral injectable. Uh, we have uh, metformin. I think a lot of people have heard about metformin. It's a very common medication, and it's also cheap. There's also uh, sulfonylurea. Uh, and and you call also this, it's also called SGLT2I. Uh, these are newer medications. It's been around for about 12 or 13 years, but they have good effects. So I'm sure many of you uh, in the audience have uh, heard about these medications. Uh, how about uh, injectables? In Injectables. It used it used to be just insulin, but uh, until about seven or eight years ago, these days there are new medications like GLP-1A. You only have to do it once uh, a month, and then it. Uh, and it's the you know, blood sugar level will alter, improve. Uh, some of my patients, uh, on the one hand, take uh, in insulin once a uh, week, and uh, and then there are others that that they uh, take other medications, and they so ask what uh, what's the best way to do. After uh, diabetes, uh, there is only about ten minutes left, so I, quickly I will go over the optimization of cardiovascular risk factors. For example, uh, high cholesterol. Uh, and I'm sure you know about uh, heart, good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. The two uh, types of bad cholesterol, one is called LDL, and the other is triglyceride. So these uh, bad cholesterol is actually uh, like blood sugar level. The, they, they accumulate substances and in your in your blood vessels, and, and then you clock in the blood, clock the blood blood vessels. Triglyceride is not good because uh, if you have too much fatty tissue, I've uh, actually a few months ago I've talked about uh, uh, fatty issues. Uh, now, if triglyceride is high, it will also uh, bring um, lower reaction to the like to the uh, insulin. Quickly, I will just uh, go over the dietary fats. Uh, the best thing is if you've heard about uh, unsaturated fat, okay, these are the healthiest ones. Uh, so what are the foods that are unsaturated, for example, uh, avocado, olive oil, uh, fish, uh, for example, salmon, or uh, uh, nuts, uh, so these are good. These are uh, unsaturated fat. There's lots of them, so these are good for your blood vessels. The other, th the other thing is what is uh, saturated fat? They're not as good as unsaturated fat, so don't eat as much as unsaturated fat. What are in uh, saturated fats? Uh, for example, red meat, or animal internal organs, or uh, sub subcutaneous fat. Mm. Uh, for example, when you go to uh, to have dim sum, don't eat too many of the uh, internal test organs of uh, of uh, beef. Uh, so uh, dairy products that are full of saturated fats, uh, you can eat them, you can take them, but not too much. At least you have some idea, especially if your cholesterol is high, you have to be careful. Uh, sorry, uh, the last thing is about trans fat. What's trans fat? Trans fat is the worst. Try not to take too much. For example, fried deep fried foods. Uh, for example, if we like to have uh, a deep fried uh, donuts, Chinese donuts, so those try to avoid them uh, because basically, uh, I mean, they've put they've, they've put, been put around for a long time. I mean, like those, those oils can be there for t one or two weeks, so try not to uh, have them because those may tend to uh, clog up your uh, blood vessels. So try to avoid them as much as possible. These trans fat co codes, uh, for example, uh, custards or uh, uh, lobster soup with the 
Gratin to don't try to uh, take that as much fossil. Well, of course, with these days, uh, technology and medicine and medical advancements, there are many kinds of uh, um, medications. There are the statin medications. If that's not enough, then you will have to uh, acetamin. And if that's still not enough, there are also new injections and injections uh, which will uh, lower your. Uh, cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, so you can ask your doctor about it. For example, if your triglyceride is high, then there is a new uh, medication, it's called I IP, uh, icosapin ethyl. Uh, so uh, you should consult your family doctor when you want to take medication. The last thing is about high hypertension. Hypertension can put uh, patients at risk of heart heart attack and stroke. You know why? Because uh, actually mo most patients don't know. Uh, like Barbara said, they are not aware. But then they find out, oh, their blood pressure is high. You know why it's bad for the heart? Because if you have high blood pressure, the, the, the power that it takes uh, to uh, pump the blood is, is too high. So it's bad for your blood pressure, for example. If you have a pipe and you have uh, you you turn on the water for a long long time and as and the, the pipe will get to will will tend to be damaged easier. So try not to have uh, blood pressure uh, of over 140 over 90. Try to keep it as low as uh, 135 over 85. Uh, you can you can test your uh, blood pressure at a doctor's office or even at home, uh, because at home that's the most relaxed atmosphere where you can uh, test your blood uh, sh sugar. So try to keep it uh, under 135 or uh, over 85. If you have, uh, if if you are diabetic, uh, try to keep it uh, as low as 130 over 80 or something. So what are the ways to uh, lower how uh, blood pressure? Try to eat less salt. Uh, don't put in uh, too much soy sauce when you eat sushi. Uh, try to lose weight. Uh, if you are overweight, then uh, lose, losing weight will help, uh, help you in that. Uh, uh, someone who snores badly, so if you have uh, sleep apnea, then you will consult a doctor, and the doctor will treat you your uh, sleep apnea. If you don't treat it well, then it will uh, bring your blood sugar, uh, blood uh, pressure high, and also try to have more fruit and vegetable and low in fat. At least do exercises for 30 minutes a day and for five days a week, if possible. For those who are taking medications, uh, try to be a good boy or good girl and listen to the doctor. To, and don't eat, take too much uh, alcohol. When I was uh, a student, they said, oh, drink, uh, have fun. No, actually, that's not the case. If you really want to take alcohol, uh, don't drink too much because alcohol can bring up your high blood pressure. And so the important thing is that heart disease risk, risk there are three highs, uh, diabetes, hypertension, and um, high lipids, so you have to be careful. If you treat them well, the chances of having heart disease will be lower. So that's my part. I'll bring the mic back to you, to Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ling, uh, for having explained so many things to us. Actually, these three highs, like you said, uh, it's, uh, they are invisible. You don't feel it, all right? So if you don't go to a doctor to test them, to uh, do tests, you won't find out. So uh, everyone should be uh, cautious. Every year, even if you don't have any pains, no, no signs, no symptoms, at least you should see a doctor to have some tests once a year and talk to your family doctor. At least you have some uh, baseline to know uh, what, what your blood sugar level is, what your blood pressure is. So thank you very much. Uh, then I'm going to introduce some of the community resources to you, which uh, Dr. Which uh, uh, Miss uh, Oscott has uh, talked about. So uh, there are many resources uh, that are uh, offered by the provincial government and the resources to uh, residents and BC. So I want to bring out uh, two of them. One of them is uh, HealthLink BC. So you can go online and uh, go to their web page. There is a lot of there's a lot of information there because today the topic is about 
the heart so you can and uh, click on uh, Health Link BC uh, for Heart Healthy Lifestyles. There are many articles on this uh, area. So I know a lot of us uh, want to know uh, what's the proper diet, what to eat, what's the right thing to eat, how much to eat, uh, when to eat, what about exercises, how to do them. So in the Heart Healthy Lifestyle, Heart Health, you can click on the, uh, the Eating for Heart Health. Uh, which tells you um, a lot of things about diet. Uh, there are many articles. There are also exercises for heart health. It's about doing exercises and uh, not only how to prevent uh, egg diseases. Uh, um, for, for those who have had heart surgery or uh, those who have uh, bypass surgery and all that, uh, you can also uh, click on this uh, exercises area to find out what exercises exercises you can do. There are also articles about hypertension, uh, what, how to have a low salt diet or heart failure, all kinds of articles and other articles that are in Chinese and you can read those Chinese when you say when you see Chinese, you just click on the Chinese um, icon, and then you will be able to read articles in Chinese. And the other uh, uh, community resource is called uh, Heart and Stroke Canada. And uh, this is, uh, uh, the Chinese name is very long, so um, the uh, on the web page, you will see a, a lot of uh, uh, information uh, for everyone to share. Uh, it also talks about uh, what is heart disease, as they have a very detailed uh, explanation, uh, uh, heart functions, uh, how does the heart work, and what what are the things that uh, are characteristics of heart disease, and, and especially coronary artery disease. And so there are all, um, all kinds of heart diseases. And uh, it also tells you, uh, for women, uh, what is a heart failure, a heart disease like in women? So there's a lot of detailed information uh, about symptoms when there's a heart attack. So you can uh, take your time and read them uh, one by one. Uh, there are many tests that your doctor may suggest that you have to go through. Uh, they also explain about those tests as well. Uh, there is a booklet called Living Well with Heart Disease. And if you already have heart disease, uh, they will tell you how to live with a heart disease, how to take care of yourself after you have had a surgery, what you have to watch out for, uh, many all the all kinds of things. They give you a very detailed information. I've clicked on it, uh, and however, this booklet is only available in English for the time being. Another thing that Heart and Stroke Canada does is CPR training. So it tell, tells you how to save lives, okay? So you can participate in that. And then you can learn how to, for example, in emergencies, how you can help a patient. So all these things, you can uh, click on those and browse and uh, just read them. Okay. Now, for the time being, so I've only talked about these two resources. I mean, there are many, many other resources that I will talk about later on. Okay, now we are going to watch a video. This is a short video, so it's to change topic. What is e-health? What, what is e-health? Have you ever wanted help managing your health or your family's health? like getting your lab results faster or finding more information about an illness or medication. Or perhaps you wanted to start exercising but weren't sure where to begin or how to set and achieve fitness goals. We've all had questions about our health and sometimes we need help answering those questions. Technology can help us get what we need. You are probably already using technology to find information online or to communicate with your friends and family. Maybe you use it to do your banking or to plan a trip. The same tools can help you better manage your health. This is called eHealth. There are different ways technology can support you and your family's health. For example, you can get health information and education from traditional sources like TV or radio. 
or you can use the internet to look up information about a health topic or to learn more about a disease. You can also look up your lab results online. Track your fitness activities with an app. Connect with healthcare providers online. Join patient support groups using social media or access your health records. All of this is eHealth. eHealth is helping patients and healthcare providers work together to ensure faster, safer, better care. And many of these eHealth tools are available in BC for you and your family. For resources and ideas on how to use eHealth safely and in partnership with your healthcare provider, visit our website. Barbara, I'm so happy to have the opportunity to f meet an old friend of ICOM and also a new friend to share the ICOM Healthy Living Healthy Heart. I'm Dr. Ho. I'm an emergency physician and also the executive director of ICON. I'm so happy to talk. Um, about e-health. In BC today, we have get the, all the, in the slide, that we get everything shown in the shot and we are making progress. I hope in this 15 minutes to give you an overview and to share this. Thank you. My uh, staff are uh, very quick to put on the slide. There are three Objectives first, how to at home use electronic uh, approach to deal with self management and also online resources and also digital to put them in use in order to test and also the online and also to uh, get in touch in medical professionals to control our health and also during the emergency. So these are the three objectives. What is the digital health? This is, what is the digital health? Is use of uh, computers, smartphones, and tablets to help us to deal with health and wellness. And I will tell you the benefit later, but unfortunately, but uh, there are people who uh, take the advantage of this uh, digital health to um, pry on your information. So if you get a resource and you know about them, you give them the pH and uh, the social insurance company or address or date of birth or financial information. Normally we won't ask for financial information, but if, if someone asks you for those information but you don't know them, the resources and you whether or not they're credible, you I will think you have to know about this first. So digital health. So self management is a part of the uh, area that can help. Well, I give you three example in on the right. There are some watch uh, smart watch can uh, measure the blood oxygen. I will talk about this later and also the heartbeat and also more many um, smart uh, watch can uh, have that kind of function in the middle. So this is the smartphone. You can download many apps um, to help you to keep your exercise pattern. Um, Dr. Ling uh, is so good that to talk about um, the 30 minute um, exercise and th there are so many examples. I will also offer you some free app, which are very helpful. I will talk about that later. And the third one is to the left. Other than that app to know about the, those information, we can also monitor the, the health um, um, data, and also it is ongoing. Uh, Dr. Ling, I already talked that, that you can put on a patch on your. Uh, sorry, uh, my microphone got off. Uh, you put a patch on your arm, and you can text uh, the blood sugar and also measure ongoing the 
blood pressures and the next die. Under those circumstances, virtual care is also to how to use the test, the monitor, and to get the figures and data so that we have a digital medical history. And the next one is virtual care. What is the difference between e-health and virtual health? Actually, virtual health is part of the e-health. Uh, it will show you in the next slide. What is virtual care? Actually, you meet the medical professional online. I'm not saying that online I can stretch out and touch you on the screen. Virtual care, there are three ways of helping the, the, the patient. First of all, online communication between a patient and a provider. Just like what we are doing now, uh, we are online, we are talking about uh, communication. This is a more simple way. In BC, we are able to uh, implement these uh, services. I will talk about it later. And the second thing, and also uh, between the provider, um, between doctor and nurse, and all our caregivers, how to get together on the virtual care to help a patient, like in the remote area. I would uh, talk to the doctor in the village, and together we can help the patient in the emergency situations. This is the second example. The third example is a hybrid care. What is a hybrid care? It's a combination of uh, in-person, person and uh, care visits. And some um, patients have this uh, um, medical data can provide it all uh, to the caregiver so that uh, together they can uh, monitor the medical uh, data. And they can tell that, oh, after you eat the uh, white rice, the blood sugar uh, uh, increase suddenly so that you can avoid, avoid uh, tomorrow or in the future. Next slide. Uh, under virtual care, there are uh, some, in terms of time, there are some uh, different ways, like uh, the video conferencing. Uh, this is the first one. We can also buy telephone. This is uh, most popular, the primary uh, mode of virtual uh, care. But if you can see the patient, that would be much better. Like uh, if someone cut the face, the wound, whether or not need to go to the emergency room, over the phone is difficult to uh, get a full picture. But but with uh, video conferencing, uh, it's much better. And uh, test messaging. Um, how to see a doctor uh, by text messaging? Well, if I have uh, some uh, skin uh, problems, uh, whether or not I need to consult a doctor, if they a uh, patient take a video of the skin areas and show it and send it to the doctor, family doctor, uh, with that uh, help, uh, the um, doctor doesn't have to uh, talk to the um, the other caregiver at the same time. It's uh, easier to deal with it. The next slide. What are the benefits uh, of this uh, virtual care? That would be, first of all, save time. Well, you don't have to drive to the ER or driving to the family doctor clinics. It's uh, taking some time. Other than saving time, in some circumstances, it's not because of the time. We need to make a decision. Like uh, in 3 a.m. and there was some uh, chest discomfort. This is the first time whether or not it's a heart disease, whether or not I need to go emergency, or I have uh, a huge dinner. The digestion is not working well, so maybe I should wait until tomorrow. Well, if there are virtual care technology, we have this opportunity. It is, this is available in BC. 
At that moment, if I want to caregiver to help me, it not only saving time, it can make a decision at that moment. It not only it will give the information to the medical professionals, and the patients are not so nervous, and they know how to uh, respond to the situation. And also, in uh, under our medical system, with this uh, e-health, that will reduce uh, the patients go to the emergency room. Actually, most patients don't want to go to the emergency department because it was a long line, uh, four hours to ten hours. So most people don't want to go there. If you have, we have the availability of virtual care, it will be very beneficial. The, if the patient has some uh, transmittable um, disease by way of virtual care, that patient doesn't have to see the doctors in person to decrease the uh, risk, health risk. And also uh, with this uh, approach, uh, people can get the, the, the medical service easily. So one of the limitations of virtual care well, with virtual care, there are limitations. We could not do any clinical uh, service. We could not uh, able to uh, uh, check the heart, and at this, we are not able to do the full body check uh, by virtual care, or we cannot do the the ultra ultrasound or. Uh, take the blood uh, test by virtual care. So there, we are not able to go beyond that. So under that system, you have to go to the hospital at 3 a.m. with uh, chest discomfort. I suspect that it, it is a heart disease. Even if it's inconvenient, I would still ask them to go to the hospital. We can uh, do a diagnosis. Well, the cut on the face, uh, uh, you cannot uh, treat it at home. You have to come to the hospital and so we can stitch it the wound. So I'll maybe tell you to go to a clinic with a medical professional. And that's why it's very acute emergency. Um, under that situation, if there's a stroke, please don't use the virtual care. Now, now we immediately to go to the emergency room. The next slide. In virtual care process, uh, you have to get prepared. In BC, uh, how to uh, get this uh, virtual care, I will talk about it. Before this uh, virtual care communication, you have to get prepared. First of all, you have to, uh, if you have a, med, a family doctor, you could consider with the his clinic whether or not the virtual uh, care is available. If the it is available or not, now what kind of uh, 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 virtual uh, care by telephone or by computer? So and also ask what under what circumstances you can use it and also tell you what kind of device or equipment will be needed. Is a smartphone, tablet, or a computer? Or what kind of software to be used? Thirdly, you need to, when the virtual care is connected, what kind of uh, lighting and what kind of uh, environment would be suitable? Uh, would be told uh, would be advise you how to prepare that uh, environment and if your families also attended the uh, virtual care so please you have phone or you can use the speaker so that the family member and you can communicate with the doctor at the same time like uh, a parent asked the uh, told doctor I will bring my uh, child and also the uh, app uh, that to be used. Uh, the most popular platform is Zoom. 
but whether or not your family doctor or other medical professional they are using Zoom or the other platform, you have to ask f first. During the virtual care, you have to, if it is the first time you use it uh, for an emergency or the walk-in clinic, it's the first visit, you have to make your health insurance card available and they will ask for the uh, card number. If your family are with you, you have to tell the professional that uh, my family is participating. And thirdly, when uh, choose a well lit location and, and hopefully there will be a window and, and you are facing the window so it won't be uh, um, the you will be well lit uh, your face and also other areas. When you uh, communicate with the professional, stay uh, in the center of the camera. If you bend the other side, then people could not see you. So stay in the center and also speak loudly and clearly. And your, also the speaker have to be uh, turned on. Have some notes, uh, paper available and pen. If you're using your smartphone, you are recording the, you can uh, write down on the smartphone uh, what the advice given to you by the medical profession. If you have your medical history, we normally ask you what kind of medicine you're taking, any allergy to medicine, and what are the symptoms, and on the first visit, we will ask all these questions. The next slide. There are four um, factors that you need to uh, be performed uh, uh, at the emergency situation. Those are the very uh, significant uh, indicators. First of all, the body temperature. If you ha have a thermometer to the left, or you can stick on to your uh, forehand or then you have a very advanced uh, device we can stick into your ear and to uh, get the, or there's a camera face, you facing a camera and you can obtain the temperature. You don't have to be using a very complicated device. Uh, uh, or put it on your mouth or under the armpit. If you want to get this, uh, this kind of device, you can go to the drugstore. The farmers will have give you advice. The next one, first is the body temperature, and the second one is the blood pressure. So we talk about the free high. Uh, every year you have to pay a visit to the doctor. One of it is the blood pressure you can uh, self manage and uh, have some preventive uh, measure like a uh, some blood pressure monitor. Like uh, you don't have to use it uh, be only because of uh, hypertension or diabetes. Actually, a blood pressure monitor is a very primary uh, tool. Um, price between $50 to $100, you can get a very decent uh, monitor. You go to a drugstore or pharmacy, the staff there will uh, give you a recommendation and you can consult your own family doctor. You can go to the presenting CA hypertension uh, CA website and they will explain to you what kind of blood pressure monitor is regarded as the best uh, device. They will give them a go uh, credit uh, recognition or the, a silver recognition. Go to Hypertension Canada website. They will recommend you to a good, uh, I recommend every family there should be a blood pressure monitor. The third um, indicator, the vital indicator would be the body temperature and the blood pressure and then it will be the heart rate. And uh, when you go to see some traditional doctor, they will uh, put uh, 
test your pulse on your wrist or your neck. If you have a uh, smartphone with a free app, which can help you to to test your heart rate. I assume you is one of the example. I have no relationship uh, at all, no conflict of interest. I don't. Uh, they don't. Get, I don't receive any monetary benefit to me. It's a free app. You download this app. You put a finger on the screen. They will. It will then uh, take your uh, heart rate. This one got uh, 86. You can see the variation of the line on the screen, up and down. Um, to the left, uh, there's a watch. There are many uh, watch can uh, take the heart rate. That app is uh, free. The watch is uh, $500 to $600, even up to $1,000. It can uh, give you uh, your heart rate and also the, that will help you. And the next one is oxygen saturation. And well, this is more important to the COVID-19, which can impact on your lung. It will cause a low oxygen saturation. To the left, uh, it's available in the drugstore. You can ask the farmers there, they will help you out. Maybe $50 up to uh, over $100. Something uh, in the $8, $70 would be uh, very decent. To the right uh, is uh, also a smartphone. Well, if uh, you are testing for the oxygen saturation, uh, it's not good on the wrist. It should be better on the finger. The, the second two last uh, uh, slide, we have uh, a uh, benefit uh, in BC to get uh, to the health gateway uh, platform. After you register there and you sign in, you can see all the medical history data, like uh, immunizations, your lab tests, or, or your um, the visit to your doctors. In the future, you may be, um, I don't know why, when they are trying to prepare for, to let you know when you will be able to see some uh, specialist or some uh, doing some lab tests. The Health Link BC, uh, Brabha have already mentioned, uh, it's not only you can get health information or some information that have been translated into Chinese. You can use uh, another app uh, to translate those information from English into Chinese. If you phone them, you have uh, some health issues, you can phone them and ask them. If you are not able to communicate in English, you can just say Cantonese. They will bring an interpreter, or you can say Putonghua, and they will get a Putonghua interpreter f to help you. The nurse will talk to you if it is necessary. They will get a medical doctor to, um, to, to be consulted by a medical doctor. I'm one of those doctors working on the 811. And we can use the virtual care um, uh, people, you can call this number anytime to ask questions. Okay. I can give leave that uh, to um, back to uh, Barbara. Thank you, Dr. Ho. Uh, you have uh, talked about the health gateway. I would like to uh, introduce this. Thank you for your time, Dr. Ho. And you are now currently, um, Dr. Ho is in Toronto, uh, remote, uh, t talking to us. Um, health Gateway is uh, available in province of BC. It is established by the BC government. During the COVID-19, uh, uh, many people get uh, 
uh, immunized, uh, vaccinated. During that time, many people uh, um, used the PC service card to in the smartphone and download from into your smartphone. If you uh, turn on the PC card app, there will be a, a item uh, health gateway, and if you press that, you can get many arriving of information from the blood test result up to 2019, up to 2023, all the lab tests, the blood tests, the colon tests would be available there. You can see all those records, and you can print them out. Uh, other than that, uh, also the farmer's uh, record, uh, what kind of medication had been prescribed and what had been, uh, it can date back to 1995. Thirdly, immunization record. If you have uh, your shot in the BC, uh, the clinics in BC, or from at the pharmacy, all these uh, would be recorded in this health gateway system. For the last seven years, what kind of uh, medication uh, 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 visit would be available, including your family doctor and specialist? And during COVID, you have. Uh, uh, take the um, uh, vaccinated would also be recorded. As uh, Dr. Ho already indicated, in the future, more and more information will be available. So I strongly recommend um, patient. Um, you know, many uh, patients told me that uh, they cannot uh, find a uh, family doctor. Uh, all the family history, the medical history is not available. So with the this uh, platform, uh, you can keep track of all your medical history with the child or minor. Uh, you can a parent can uh, sign up for them. Then there's another one in uh, November. BC government have uh, released uh, a some new program to helping uh, patient, people with patient, uh, diabetes can, can get more tools under the PC PharmaSafe. Uh, as uh, Dr. Ho indicated, uh, testing and monitoring is uh, very uh, useful. Uh, at home, especially at the early stage of diabetes, when you are taking medication, you we need to uh, have this uh, keep track of all your sugar, blood sugar trend. So under in BC, now you have the subsidy or the coverage will be uh, extended, including more device and tool. Dr. Ling had uh, indicated that uh, Uh, painless uh, test, uh, like uh, I think this is uh, the latest uh, device. You just put it in your arm, and you can carry, put it on your arm for 14 days. And now, at the very beginning, there's only one brand. There's uh, another brand. It's also included in the um, coverage. This is not the latest model. These tools would help um, people uh, with diabetes with all this uh, testing. You don't have to uh, poke your finger every time, every day. It's very pain. It can last 14 days, so you can keep track your blood sugar ongoing. So you can go to the website of uh, pharmasafe.com. Uh, and now uh, we were moving on to the third uh, speaker. 
um, Dr. Chen is now in Hong Kong, so he is giving his talk uh, specifically. Uh, Dr. Ten Siu Kim is a cardiologist. He will try to explain atrial fibrillation and risk of stroke. And what are the f risk factors? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chen. Welcome to this forum. What time is it? How are you, Barbara? Here it's seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> seven o'clock. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, so, everybody online, I'm happy that I can meet with you guys on a weekend and share with you about atrial fibrillation and um, other other things, other topics. And uh, today in this uh, seminar, uh, you are going to learn about how uh, atrial fibrillation is diagnosed and how it's treated, and what are the effective ways to prevent complications such as uh, stroke. So the most important thing is stroke. That's the major complication. So first of all, I want to talk about stroke. Before we do that, we have to understand the structure of your heart. Uh, so uh, many times, uh, uh, I um, the analogy is um, the heart is like a car. So you can see that there are many structural parts, in, like an, a house in the heart. So there are rooms which are chambers in the in the um, heart, a heart, and uh, connecting to the uh, chambers are uh, valves which are doors. So to prevent to prevent your blood from flowing back, and in the house there's electric electricity and supply and the water. So there you will have um, a coronary artery, and the function of that is to um, to supply the blood into the heart for use. Uh, today I am going to go deeper uh, to explain uh, about the electrical circuit. So it's like uh, your lights, lighting system, and other electrical appliances at home. The last thing is about the heart muscles, uh, which is uh, we call. Um, uh, myocardium, it's like the walls. So, in other words, uh, in the um, heart, there's the pericardium, which protect the heart. Now, we go deeper to understand uh, the electrical system. Now, the electrical system w determines whether y your heart functions are normal uh, or the heart rhythm. So, the Electrical electrical system in the heart is very simple. Every heartbeat is on your from your left atrium. Also, this is called sinus node, and this sinus node, and uh, it is a rather rare uh, system, a cell in the body. So, Doctor Ho has mentioned that uh, the normal heartbeat is between fifty and sixty, but. At, uh, Normal electrical electrical system. So every five uh, minutes, it will be um, triggered, and then you will have AV note in the middle. In other words, the uh, atrium that is the part between the atrium and the ventricle, and this note is like uh, the border between Canada and the United States of America. So it's a filtering system. So if uh, you cross the border, the electrical current would then go into the left atrium or the right atrium. And it goes it goes through wiring. It's called heat bundle, or bundle branch. And then when it goes into the left atrium or the right atrium, then it activates the muscle to uh, palpitate, so uh, it then supplies the blood into the whole body. And often we have to understand your heart rhythm, whether it's too slow or too fast or irregular. So Dr. Ho has mentioned that there are many uh, apparatus that can test your heart rhythm. So normally, our for cardiologists or family doctors will. Uh, 
refer you to a, a ECG which uh, is put on your chest or on your limbs to uh, feel the electrical current that comes out from your heart and so these are examples that I can show you. Uh, from this graph, you can see how fast or your, how slow your, uh, whether the, the rhythm is regular or irregular. The topmost one is what we call it's normal uh, heart, uh, heart rhythm is 75 beats per minute. So they go up and down. And so th this is the uh, beats between the atrium and the ventricle, and then the the lowest one is the ventricle, and the highest one is the atrium. When, you, when you're sleeping or when you take medications, the normal heartbeat would be slower. The second one is as when the heartbeat is too slow. So you can see there's more uh, bigger interval between beats. So you may have uh, 40 to 50 beats per minute. It doesn't mean that it's uh, a medical condition, but that's what happens when you sleep. When you're awake, well, when you go to the gym or when you try to catch the bus, of course, your heartbeat will go up. So we go up, we go to the third graph, and then it's more frequent. It's still a normal heartbeat, but it's just a little faster. Just like uh, when you accelerate uh, when driving a car, that's, it goes faster. This patient's uh, heart rate is too high. Her, over 150 beats per minute. But don't worry about it because uh, we can go as fast as 22, 220 minus your age. And uh, in, when it's uh, too fast, say if it's faster than 180 or if it's slower than 30, then there are symptoms of medical conditions. So this is a major topic today. Uh, we're going to talk about irregular heartbeat uh, which is um, atrial fibrillation. So, so when it's between 101 and 120, it's irregular. Uh, sometimes it's more frequent, sometimes it's less frequent. So you take your pulse and find out too. And if they say that you are irregular, then you have to do something. So what's the uh, theory behind atrial fibrillation? So either the left chamber, the left um, atrium, the left uh, right atrium, uh, there's something called um, it's between 50 and 60 per minute. It's like a a drummer who has regular beat, but when that happens, like me, if I don't know anything about music, and I, 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 I'm all, always off beat, so there's problem here. Too. There's something called uh, atrial fibrillation impulses. It goes down to the um, atrium and then down to the left uh, atrium or the right trip, right atrium, because the beats are so fast. Sometimes there is some between 400 and 600. Uh, fortunately, in our body, uh, we have uh, the atrium that can uh, filter it, uh, buffer it. Otherwise, it will be life-threatening. So, because of that, that uh, because of the note, after you cross the U.S. Canada border, so it can go only as fast as about 100. But if it's over uh, 150 or 180, then it's irregular. So there are signs of medical conditions. Let's look again. Uh, there's the recognition of heart rhythm. Up there, there's normal heart rhythm. The drama keeps up with the beat. And down there is when you have uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, it's chaotic. So when you have atrial fibrillation, uh, actually it affects more than one million Canadians here in Canada. And many people don't realize they have this condition because there are no signs or symptoms. And statistics tell us that people who are over 70, one in seven of Can those Canadians have has atrial fibrillation. And the cost of that is one billion dollars per year. So if um, they cannot control the heart rhythm or 
if there are complications like strokes, so then you have to be hospitalized. That strokes can be very, very serious and could mean a long period of hospitalization. And we don't know about how long it will take to rehabilitate. For those who are over 40, one in four strokes uh, for those after 40 is caused by atrial fibrillation. So uh, if you have had a stroke or signs of a stroke, signs of stroke symptoms, uh, the doctor will give you a very thorough examination uh, about uh, atrial fibrillation. It's frightening, right? But uh, in cardiology, it is uh, a, how should I put it? Well, I mean, the patients should have a lot of knowledge about it. And there are other related strokes uh, uh, complications which I, which I want to share with you. Um, atrial fibrillation, there are like many risk factors. For example, uh, advancing age, one in seven Canadians, so that is a risk. For males, yes, the, the risks are higher than women. Other heart conditions, um, for example, um, in the heart, there are m many structural elements in the heart. If any issues um, arise, for example, the walls are damaged or functions are, are affected, so its electrical system may be may go out of wire. So, uh, so sometimes it could affect the uh, pressure inside the atrium, and then it would cause problems in the electrical system. Other uh, medical conditions that, uh, for example, thyroid disease. Uh, for example, if there's too much th thyroid or too little thyroid hormones, then there are problems. So we've talked about the three highs so often. Uh, that could also be a risk factor for atrial fibrillation. And uh, chronic disease, disease, kidney disease is very common. And also there are external factors, for example, uh, too much alcohol intake, and then uh, it could um, accelerate the uh, chances of having a atrial fibrillation. Uh, and it could affect the heart, so don't drink too much alcohol. Uh, other factors that we don't mention that much are lifestyles and your diet and sleep apnea. So why sleep apnea may cause uh, atrial fibrillation? Because when you cannot breathe, when you have apnea, because and then, and then the uh, pores are um, closed. So when you suddenly wake up and uh, lungs, the, those, the, the supply will go into the, uh, the, the, ve the veins and the lungs are connected. So uh, you've heard about how the heart and the lungs are connected. So when you have atrial fibrillation, uh, so uh, we have to check uh, the quality of the sleep. Uh, uh, to see your uh, uh, oxygen saturation level, so to see if it's uh, normal, or not, uh, normal or not, so the doctors may take you, refer you to a test. There are other triggers. Uh, if you do have this uh, condition, what are the triggers for the for atrial fibrillation? For example, different kinds of medications. Uh, say if you take drugs or if you take alcohol, that would also trigger or accelerate the chances of atrial fibrillation. Uh, sleep deprivation or emotional stress or too much physical exertion can also cause uh, atrial fibrillation. And a uh, kind of curious uh, observation that we've made is that uh, younger people, uh, they still have atrial fibrillation because they are too uh, active. Uh, for example, athletes, athletes they uh, have too much ex ex exertion, so the atrium uh, is too expanded. And also problems with uh, gastrointestinal system, um, the, and the doctor will have to determine whether uh, is it because of uh, if someone has surgery before, they may want to find out whether that's caused by a surgery or other uh, factors. So that they will then consider what kind of treatments would be appropriate.
And we've also talked about other symptoms. Sometimes there are no symptoms. For example, if the first time, this is the first time that something uh, alarming happens, that maybe it's too late because there may be a chances of a stroke. Uh, for example, uh, irregular heartbeat or uh, palpitations, or chest pain, shortness of breath, even dizziness. Sometimes. Uh, May, you may not feel that the heart is beating very fast, but still, uh, for a normal heart rhythm, if it goes back to normal heart, normal heart rhythm, they will tell me, oh, my energy has come back, oh, I feel a lot better, I feel high energy. But actually, they're not aware that there may already be atrial fibrillation. fibrillation. But if the heart beats too fast, then they, you may have uh, chances of having uh, uh, heart failure. So uh, Dr. Ho mentioned about uh, palpation, taking pulses. So doctors will uh, take pulses on your wrist and on your neck. And, uh, actually, f to be more precise, uh, we uh, use a, a auscultation. That means we use a, a, a e our ears to listen to your pulse. Uh, so, But uh, it's difficult when you do it uh, virtually. Uh, but if you're afraid that you have atrial fibrillation, then of course you will have to do an ECG if it does not detect it, because it only takes 10 seconds. Then I will ask you to uh, wear a halter monitor, and then they would monitor you for 24 hours. Then if uh, it's over 24 hours, or say if in, within 24 hours we cannot de detect it, then we will use another monitor or other devices on demand to um, detect it right away, like Dr. Um, Ho just mentioned, that, for example, then you can use a cell phone, and then you can have an app, and, and then send the results, email the results to your doctor. If you have uh, atrial fibrillation, if it's diagnosed, we must have a echocardiogram. So it's also called a, a colorful um, so ultrasound, so we to find out that if your heart uh, atrium has been expanded, and then we have to be very careful about how to treat it. Um, so this uh, graph graphic tells you the uh, echocardiogram. There are four chambers, and uh, it's all usually put on your um, sternum. To the last, the last one is a. A normal heart, and you see LV, not not the back, of course, uh, and then RV and LA, and then RA and LA. So these are left, right ventricles, and right, left um, atria. So, so if your atrium is expanded, so like LA, and then you can see that in the left one is too wide. So if that happens, and uh, the uh, fibrillation is more permanent and may not uh, recover to uh, n normal. The basis for treatment, we have three what we call cornerstones of therapy. For example, if the heart beat is too fast, you have to lower it. And if it's between 180 to 200, then it, is, it could be life-threatening. So Dr. Ho, if he sees you in emergency, then he gives you um, some anesthesia to uh, or maybe electric shock to change it to uh, normal heartbeat. And then you have rhythm control. If it's too slow already, and the, because of the chaotic uh, heartbeat, then there are medications or electric shock that can bring it back to uh, normal heartbeat. Whatever happens, whatever way to uh, control the heart rhythm, you have to consider the risk of a stroke, because if you have risk of having a stroke and if you ignore those risks, it can be very, very dangerous. So we've mentioned that uh, how to, to control your heart rate. If it's over 100 beats per minute, then I would usually start to prescribe medications, different kinds of medi uh, medications. medications. Uh, the most common is a beta blocker. I think you've uh, heard about uh, different types of uh, once a day type of beta, beta blockers, and then you don't have to take other medications. Another one is called calcium channel blocker, and uh, this medication 
we have to think about whether there are problems with uh, heart failure. The older one is uh, digoxin, and um, in our generation, uh, uh, the doctors here don't uh, use that that often because it's a older type of medication. Um, so uh, digoxin actually is quite um, effective. And uh, we've mentioned that uh, if there are um, acute uh, conditions, if you want to change it to normal heart rate, uh, usually you will use electric shock. But if it's uh, if there's time to control it, if it's not so urgent, if it's a chronic way to treat it, then we can uh, prescribe other medications to bring your heartbeat back to normal. And those medications are uh, have more side effects. For example, Ficanide, uh, uh, those medications are uh, prescribed by uh, uh, specialists like cardiologists. They're only prescribed by them because the dosage and the consideration of side effects are very uh, are taken into account. And the last thing is uh, surgery. Surgery is ablation. We usually call it ablation. This is an intrusive uh, way to uh, uh, to make um, atrial fib fibrillation go away. Uh, so w what it does is to put it in your uh, vein. Of course, I don't do that. Uh, a cardiologist would, that, would do it. Electrophysiologist would do that. And then after they put it inside, and it goes right into the veins to the left uh, atrium. So We've talked about how the heart and the lungs are connected. So maybe the cause is uh, these are called hot spots, the pulmonary veins. Uh, so around there are four of them. So uh, the ablation technology is to put it uh, around uh, the, the the veins so that there are no more electrical electrical currents going around it. Um, so uh, even if there are electrical signals, uh, they cannot uh, uh, trigger the uh, electrical signals to affect other parts of the atrium. The last part is about stroke. So, so if you have atrial fib fibrillation, if you're over 65 years of age, of course, there are certain risks, about uh, 1 to 2 percent a year. And there are the risk factors, for example, if you've if you're over 75, if you're diabetic or heart failure, or if you had history of uh, stroke, so your chances of having stroke are doubled. So we have to use uh, blood thinners. So actually, uh, the idea of stroke is uh, when your, your uh, atrial fibrillation uh, brings about some some plaque, and then it goes into your atrium and pumps into your whole body, and then it's like an express train. It goes up to your uh, brain, and it causes a stroke. And uh, this uh, algorithm is to show you when uh, we have to use blood thinners. Uh, sometimes the first question we ask is, are you over 65? Or what? If you are, then you have to take blood thinners. If you're under 65, uh, so you have to think about uh, uh, chats, the chances of chat, high blood pressure, or high cholesterol. If those happen, then you have to take blood thinners. So if you don't have those risk factors, and but you have coronary artery, artery disease or other kind of diseases, you don't take blood thinners, but you have to take aspirin. Uh, but there are still chances of having stroke, but not as high. We've talked about uh, how to score and uh, uh, chat. So there are these other factors. We add the score up to see if you have uh, uh, are at risk of having a stroke. So if you do have all kinds of risks, then your score is high. If you have a full mark, a full mark is six. So if you have six, then you, the chances of having a stroke is 18%. That means one in five. If you don't take blood thinners, you will suffer stroke. So, so we suggest uh, 
uh, stroke medications. Warfarin is uh, an older type uh, of uh, medication. There are newer ones called DOAC, which are direct oral anticoagulants. There are four of them. Then you can take them either once a day or twice a day. So these blood thinners can uh, lower your risk of having strokes by about uh, 60 to 70 percent. Here it says 67 percent. So. Often, we, uh, some people want to worry about it. What about what happens when they bleed? So, of course, uh, the, this blood thinner will uh, have a problem of hemorrhage. Uh, so, we have to watch out for uh, dangerous signals. If there's blood in your urine, in your feces, or if you have blood pressure, uh, blood, if you have headaches, then you have to seek help. Uh, medical help immediately, or see if you have to stop your medications. Uh, warfarin is an older medication. Uh, we, we don't use them that often, so but we regularly uh, do blood, blood tests, so it's too much trouble for uh, seniors. So we use uh, DOAX, um, directly taken oral, orally taken anticoagulants, uh, and, and then we can uh, adjust the sausage. Uh, there are one or two types that um, are, are kind of expensive that we will discuss with patients. So if you have uh, issues with uh, atrial fibrillation, then you have to think about where to seek help. Uh, mostly you go to family doctors to diagnose it and then treat it. And then if you need uh, more help, then you will go to internal uh, medicine specialists or cardiologists. Some, um, some more difficult issues, then we have to uh, refer you to atrial uh, fibrillation clinic for to be treated by experienced doctors, uh, so they can help you. And uh, there are uh, outpatient clinics uh, at uh, VGH, St. Paul's Hospital, as well as uh, Royal Columbia Hospital, which is in um, Westminster, New Westminster, RCH. And then we can um, show you some references. Well, Thank you, Dr. Chan, uh, for presenting to us uh, the, relation, the relations between atrial fibrillation and risk. So I'm going to uh, take you to some community resources uh, where you can browse and uh, find out more information from. Uh, I've talked about HealthLink BC. There's a lot of information in there. And if you click on Stroke, and then you will see a whole load of information. And then there's a detailed explanation on what is uh, stroke, why people have strokes, uh, what are the symptoms, signs, how is it diagnosed, and there are also recommendations if uh, you've had a stroke before, how to manage it, how to uh, recover from it, and uh, what uh, connection does it have with our heart diseases? So some articles are in Chinese, so you can read them. And also there is a uh, family caregiver of BC. Let's see what it is in Chinese. OK, I see. There are nine characters in the Chinese name. Well, for the time being, it's usually in English. However, uh, you if you dial in there, you can help your family to, to who are caregivers because uh, taking care of patients is not a simple task. Sometimes you don't only take care of the patient; you have to take care of little children, or if you if you're working. How can you juggle all these uh, responsibilities and uh, manage emotionally? You may need help yourself. So this uh, family caregivers of BC can uh, you can dial the hotline to seek help uh, to ask them questions, or if you want to talk to them about uh, your uh, stress or other issues. They have different groups they can refer you to participate in and then discuss together these issues to see how they can help you. Oh, good. We let me bring back the Dr. Ling and Dr. Chang. Thank you, the two of you, to stay behind. Um, there are 
some people have already some uh, put in some questions. Some of them are really uh, meaningful for some questions to be answered now. I ask those questions now. Well, I also, there are many other questions in the Q&A box. And if we are not able to finish them, we will uh, leave it back to the follow-up uh, workshop. The first question, Dr. Ling, the lung function, uh, uh, the back function, uh, would that affect the heart condition? I have to talk about the, the close relationship between lung and heart. If the lung is not working well, depending on what disease, if the oxygen is not enough uh, carrying to the heart, some of the lung disease will um, will cause the damage to the heart conditions. Um, well, sleep uh, uh, the apnea or the right uh, atrium will be affected too. So they are clearly related. So if they have uh, this condition, they should uh, consult uh, the doctor. Yes, uh, they are closely linked. It, so this must be follow up uh, to see how uh, what, what how progress. Dr. Ling, uh, the other question is for you too. From time to time, I have some uh, chest uh, discomfort, and uh, in order to relieve, I have to take deep breath. Would that mean that the uh, uh, coronary uh, artery is a block clock? Well, it depends. Uh, it can maybe or maybe not. Uh, it, the best way is to go to the doctor to um, go through the EGM or uh, and also uh, do some uh, uh, stress uh, testing uh, and also the, sometimes do you use, use the colored uh, ultrasound test. If uh, if this friend have uh, there's a high risk uh, for heart condition like the free highs, I advise them to go to see the doctor. Well, if, it would be great if it's nothing to worry about, but go there and prevent in advance. Dr. Cheng, this friend asked, uh, what does he mean by sinus with the first degree AV block? So the heart rate is normal. But they are, I was told that they were first degree AV block. It's a normal. It's a normal result. If the sign of reform is an AV block, is a, I've told uh, show you the diagram. The sign of to the the U.S. Uh, Canada boundary. If the conduction is slowed down. So it will be slowed down. But most of the times, it is related to age and also your medication. It's not a serious factor. So if you can't remember anything, because it's the first degree, it's, it's not a, only the second and the third degree is you, it may cause more concern. Dr. Chen, uh, the heart rate rhythm uh, about 50 or up around 50, is it a, a stroke factor? The normal uh, heart rate is 60 to 100. During sleep, it will slow down. It's normal. It's OK. Even it get to as low as 40, 50, it won't uh, have impact on the heart. Well, unless uh, when it is a 50, that cause you a lot of discomfort. While you're um, exercising, if you want to increase your heart rate, it's supposed to be go to 90, but it cannot reach 90. Like you're driving, you push the gas, it won't go up, unable to up, go uphill, then it should be a concern. So it, uh, depending on the condition, if it is, uh, 50 when you are stat static, so it's not a concern. I have uh, 
met some uh, patient, they have um, a lot of exercise and active, so their heart rate is only 40 something. What about my uh, heart rate up to 86 to 90? Well, that's on the other side of the spectrum. Of if it is higher, normal people, uh, the heart rate will go up um, inherently. Well, my heart rate is 80 to 90, even though when I was uh, sitting, it's not a, it's not a disease. If you have no medical condition and below 100, it's not a problem. Like uh, what Barbara just said, uh, if you are exercising, he, if you say that I have to be 90, no matter what condition, when I was sleeping, when I was sitting, well, that would be a problem. Well, the electric current is not it's not appropriately the conducting the to give the heart a appropriate stimulate. I know most circumstances uh, below 100 or below 90 is not a, a concern. Dr. Ling, the back pain would it have any relationship with the Heart. Uh, there are many factors for back pain. With the back, you have a uh, muscle and the bulk. Most of the time, it's structural issues. But this question is a very good question. Uh, sometimes the coronary, cor coronary heart disease, one of the symptoms is the back uh, discomfort. S some the the uh, the heart artery no. If the, it is swollen, then there will be pain, back pain. If the acute pain causing sweating, you have to go to the emergency room uh, because of the main artery maybe have been damaged. So if you are not sure, you have to go to see your doctor. Thank you. Another friend, I also AV block. Would it be reverse? Would it be back to the normal? And also long haul flight, would it be a concern? <laughs> I, I will let the Dr. Chen answer this. If your AV block is an uh, inheritant, it, or is it aging, then it won't return back to the normal. Your car is is used, that it is used. That. But if it is medication called this, so you have to determine whether whether or not you are the first, first or second, some uh, senior P, uh, uh, they have uh, dementia, they are taking medication, it may have impact. So you have to balance out whether or not it's causing some AV block, but uh, with some AV block, there's no symptom. You may be taking the chance, but most people, if it is on first degree, AV block with no symptom. So it's only the EMT. Uh, it won't be uh, a concern for health. It, you don't have to be over concerned. Some the patient, uh, well, my heart uh, beat was is very irregular, sometimes fast, sometimes slow. Under what circumstances? It's a concern to go to see a doctor or to conduct to take some tests. Two questions. To to answer, if this is irregular compared to the normal condition, well, I feel it. It was. It is too slow. It will suddenly drop. Uh, drop. If you can describe so. Um, Radically, of course, you you need to go to uh, monitor and to take a test, or is or on the other hand, it's going so fast, it's rushing up to 130 or 140 without any reason. Well, if this is not uh, something that is normal, then you have to go to see the doctor and you have to ask the doctor to see um, to go through the regular test. It's not so time consuming to take those tests. While under extreme 
cases, if the patient are faint, fainting, if the electric current is so the band, the the patient is collapsed, and then came came back and become like it is normal, just like when you turn off the light and in the evening and then turn it on. Then if it happened like this, it is a concern. So whether or not this is an electric current turned on and off without any reason. So you have to go to the doctor or the, to the hospital. Thank you. This patient has a pacemaker. Is it true that he have to change every five years? The, is this process uh, safe? Uh, if it is going to be replaced every five years, there's uh, almost a must uh, for you to have a pacemaker like an iPhone, or and you have to turn it on all the time. If you turn on 24 hours around the day, then you have to replace it every five years. Secondly, or it's an old model. So the pacemaker battery won't last too long. Uh, replacing the battery is a minor process. You don't have to do deal with the why. Just uh, put in a new battery with a small uh, uh, hole. Yeah, but it is necessary. This is the last uh, resort. It is for you to protect. Uh, it won't go down to 50. If you have AV block, hard block, if you don't have the pacemaker, your your hardware will go down to zero. So you need it. You have to replace it. Uh, with the latest uh, technology, replacing the battery is uh, nothing. It's very simple. So uh, if cardio, if it's fifty percent of uh, the the cardio artery is blocked. Uh, was it necessary to uh, go through the, <laughs> the surgery? No, you, you should answer it, Dr. Chen. Um, uh, seventy percent. We will have to answer if it is seventy percent. If it is only fifty percent, you know, um, the Western medicine uh, there's a cause for any uh, processes. There's a good uh, uh, complication of one and uh, 500 chance of uh, a complication for this uh, process. Most doctor will tell you that it won't worth it unless you have 70% risk and with symptom, then uh, you have to weigh the uh, pro and con. 50% we will go with the medication. Oh, Dr. Ling, sleep apnea uh, has anything to do with the heart uh, disease? Uh, sleep apnea is uh, during the sleep, um, the oxygen supply is not uh, <coughs> sufficient. The airway of your uh, respiratory system, because of the, the effect, uh, it was blocked by uh, the airway uh, during the sleep, and some people were not uh, breathing normally and uh, snoring loudly. The body react like this. We is we try to uh, breathe hardly, so the blood pressure will go up. Normal people, the blood pressure will go down, but people with sleep and uh, they would uh, still have high uh, blood pressure because they try very hard to breathe more in order to get more oxygen. What is the impact on the heart it is uh, hyperpressure and a stroke, better chance of stroke. Uh, without proper uh, treatment uh, on uh, the, the vein in uh, the blood uh, in the lung will go up uh, the pressure. So uh, sleep apnea is not uh, only uh, dealing with sleep. You have to address it. So it have to to see what kind of uh, specialist. The first 
you have to find out whether uh, there is or not. It's not. There's a procedure that you can uh, monitor it uh, at home to see whether or not uh, you uh, the oxygen level goes so low, then uh, the airway has been uh, blocked while not uh, flowing fully, uh, smoothly. When it is confirmed, the doctor will to, to, to get uh, a machine to put it on. Uh, if it is a fat people, reducing the weight is uh, body weight is a, a good way. And hyper pressure patients, you have to address it too. Uh, sleep and uh, people with said that, as indicated by Dr. Chen, he will also uh, affect the heart the rhythm. While you are not relaxing uh, during sleep, uh, the blood rhythm would be more probable. The next uh, one question that they um, have put on stand uh, eight years ago, it seemed working well. Why yeah, have to take the aspirin uh, long term? Well, the stand is could only to, uh, for the short term. It will uh, uh, clock again. So people, uh, doctor recommend aspirin or some blood thinner medication. Why aspirin is still uh, prescribed uh, much later? Since the, that person have already been some uh, coronary disease, and the aspirin is protecting your blood vessel to long term. Not only the, pay, the session of the uh, blood vessel where the stand was inserted, because that person have already be required to put on stand. It's uh, trying to uh, using the aspirin to keep the blood vessels uh, uh, unclog. So aspirin is uh, has nothing to do with the stand. The situation of the patient required to taking med aspirin to mitigate the risk. So. Um, it is a lifelong uh, 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 medication. So it's uh, for protection. So to keep the blood flowing uh, fully and uh, smoothly. OK. Uh, we have an attendant, attendee here who has uh, about, uh, it's like a lotus root. Um, is there any remedy for this problem? Dr. Chen, your turn. Uh, about uh, Dr. Ling, uh, 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 you're putting me on the spot. Okay, okay. L l let me answer this first. Now, usually if uh, there are areas where the blood vessel is narrow, uh, where some parts are too uh, why it depends on whether it's hereditary or not, but, but because um, uh, actually the risks are high. In other words, uh, uh, the coronary artery disease is the risk is already there. Uh, so it's not just uh, uh, as simple uh, as uh, having a s surgery. Uh, so because there is also the high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and. Uh, um, uh, diabetes. So we want to um, stop the blood vessel from narrowing. And if you keep uh, drinking or uh, smoking, so there may be uh, more narrowing for that. So um, Dr. Chan, do you want to add some more? Yes, I have some something a little bit to add. Uh, and you're talking about the, uh, uh, low Lotus root. This is the only time that I've heard the, an analogy like that. Atasia is different. Atasia is hereditary, uh, meaning yeah, this the shape of your uh, artery is a little weird. Uh, some uh, some spots are narrower, some spots are wider. So it's not not the same thing. Uh, usually, when do you do it? When you I do a CT, so uh, by chance you may find it up, but um, rarely it's not like atasia where it's like a lotus root and you can treat it. As far as I know, uh, uh, this, uh, the 
tear of the artery. This is not uh, directly connected unless the wider part is very, very part of more than 45 millimeters. So you're absolutely right. Um, the three highs, uh, you have to control them. Uh, don't Your blood pressure cannot be too high, otherwise it will expand further. Uh, other issues you have to uh, consider, for example, diabetes and high blood pressure. Artesia itself, um, do, you, do you need a stent? No, actually, you don't need to anything to do anything, but you have to manage the risk. So as, as long as you don't uh, let the narrow part uh, are blocked up or uh, the wider part getting too wide, that should be okay. Okay, this is a long question. The lower cl uh, cholesterol, are the medications will help uh, maintain heart health to prevent stroke, a heart uh, disease, or and usually if the uh, artery is clogged, so uh, to uh, which extent would you need an angioplasty? Who should answer? Oh, other than medications, are there other uh, natural uh, ways to lower LDL? Okay, Dr. Link, fine. Now, if you already have uh, 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 blood vessel problems, uh, medications do not help uh, entirely. It only help to lower uh, blood pressure, especially bad uh, cholesterol, uh, LDL. Uh, this is uh, one of the reasons that uh, the blood vessel is clogged. But usually uh, uh, there's a statin, which is a type of medication that uh, will uh, uh, um, lower your risk of your uh, blood vessel being clogged, and uh, for us, uh, for those who have uh, coronary artery disease, this would be good for them. Or if those who have uh, heart disease, it is good for them as well. So actually, overall, uh, this is good for the heart. And these medications, uh, statin, not only lower your cholesterol, there's a protective mecha mechanism because uh, it, uh, for example, the uh, sclerosis. Uh, will uh, stop them from uh, deteriorating, and uh, so they, if you don't take those medications, the chances of being blocked are higher. So, so the coagulants that uh, are built up in your uh, blood vessels uh, won't. Um, be too bad all of a sudden. So if you have uh, medications, uh, you should take those medications. Medications control your LDL. Other than medications, what else can help? Uh, so we have talked about diet. You have to watch out for your diet, especially uh, not eat uh, too much foods that uh, too many foods that uh, have. Uh, trans trans fats like fried deep fried foods uh, because deep fried foods uh, uh, make your bad cholesterol uh, go up and also uh, saturated fats uh, you should eat more or eat some but not all for example not so much red meats uh, preferably you should eat more saturated fats and non saturated fats where like olive oil or do exercises like Dr. Chen said so doing exercises help to control your cholesterol to have control of three highs and help your heart thank you the last question uh, Dr. Chen uh, this attendee has already got uh, HU uh, fibrillation since 2001 and uh, is he has not seen a specialist ever. So is there any, he's only go, gone for updates uh, regularly. But he's on medications, uh, Exalator, and another, he, I don't think is spelled right. But anyway, he, does he have to follow up on it? If you're already taking blood thinner, and uh, the doctor may have uh, Given some thought about that, to give you the appropriate treatment. Uh, for example, uh, blood thinner. Uh, the uh, the major objective is to lower the risk of having a stroke. But most patients don't really have to see a specialist. But probably they should regularly uh, uh, check their medications. For example, if you are taking blood thinners, are there any? 
um, complications, uh, the heartbeats uh, irregular, uh, they're too, uh, they're too fast, uh, there are other symptoms, uh, also um, regular check of your kidney functions, uh, b because the, the dosage depends on your kidney functions. And over two so many years, have you done the colorful uh, sonic uh, ultrasound? And uh, because if you don't check your heart functions, you don't know how your function level is. Maybe you have already got uh, failure, uh, so you, you don't feel it. Well, at least there is uh, the basic ultrasound. And if the family doctor has given it some thought, then you should also see a uh, specialist. But yes, yeah, someone has to follow up on it, right? Correct. Every six months to a, a year, so you have to at least go and check your the status of your condition. There should be a it should be there should be a specialist who is dedicated to this. So, uh, so it's a chronic disease. So you have to s sit down with a specialist for ten to fifteen minutes to talk about this. So because of time constraints today, uh, that's all the qu answers we can. That's all the questions that we can answer. Those we have not answered. Well, hopefully in the near future we will have another webinar to uh, answer those questions. Now I thank uh, Dr. Ling and Dr. Chen, especially Dr. Chen, who is uh, in Hong Kong to uh, do this talk. Uh, uh, their presentations with us today and provided so much, share with us so much information as well as community resources. So I hope that everybody will fill out the uh, survey questionnaire, complete it, and uh, if you have not, uh, you're not on the mailing list of, on the email list, well, you can scan it scan me, look at the QR code, and then become a ma part of our uh, mailing list, and we will tell you what our next activities are. So we hope, we thank uh, our partner Patients as Partners Initiative, and um, we also uh, thank our uh, partners in the community, uh, so many of them, and uh, to support us, to help us. And we also appreciate our media partners' help to help us promote this event and also uh, tell us, publicize this event. We also thank uh, the uh, viewing hubs, uh, uh, those organizations that uh, happen, that uh, Organized view hubs, there are four of them, CRC Health Center, South Vancouver Neighborhood Health Success, and Villa Cathay Care Home. I thank you all and uh, thank those attendees who are here in live, and uh, especially the three speakers, Dr. Ling, uh, uh, Dr. Ho, and Dr. Chan. Thank you very much for taking your time and uh, share such uh, valuable information with us. We also thank our interpreters, uh, Shiny, Wenhui, and Cliff, and Rifek. Uh, you're welcome. And <laughs> tomorrow, <laughs> we have more um, presentations. But for today, this is the end of our presentations. After all, prevention is better than treatment. So maintain good health while you're still young. So even if you can treat it, it doesn't mean that it's better than preven prevention. So while you're young, while you still have a chance to learn more about chronic diseases,